Hello, I'm Dale Witt from Charleston Area Medical Center. Welcome to our Imagine You webcast. Thank you to all the schools participating from across West Virginia. We appreciate the students and the faculty who are watching. Near the end of the webcast, we'll show you all the opportunities that CAMC has made available to students. But first, let me introduce you to Caitlin Blake, a radiologic technologist at CAMC. It wasn't long ago that she was sitting in a classroom just like you, watching an Imagine well, You webcast like this. It helped her decide on a career. But, Watch um, as she tells us her story. Well, I'd always been interested in medicine, but um, watching the video, the surgery through Imagine You, I think is what really cemented my desire to go into the medical field. Prior to that, I'd you know, only been exposed to medicine through TV shows like House, but actually seeing it happen, um, it got me thinking that, you know, this is really interesting. This is something that I can see myself being involved with professionally. And it was a knee replacement surgery. I think it really opens people up to the reality of medicine um, that otherwise wouldn't have access to that kind of knowledge, you know, in high school. I think if they'd get to experience something like that, it would show them what it's really like, what they can expect to deal with. So I was looking into both nursing and uh, radiologic science at UC. I went to UC on one of their innovation days and uh, they had little events where you would go and you'd talk to professors and they'd explain about the profession and um, what it entails, what you can expect. and. Radiology just really stuck with me. I found it fascinating from a science point of view, um, as well as with the patient care aspect. I like that I get to work hands-on with patients and interact with them. In high school, I took a lot of uh, science courses, anatomy, physiology, chemistry, biology, things like that, as well as some uh, upper level college and AP courses. So um, going into UC, I was actually a little bit ahead and uh, was able to, for the first couple semesters, take a few extra classes that I just kind of wanted to, like uh, microbiology, things like that. The curriculum for the radiologic science program was also very science-oriented, um, more anatomy and physiology, radiation physics, and that just really clicked with me. I usually get here in the evenings or later on at night. Um, day shift versus night shift is a little bit different. It tends to be a little more laid back at night. Um, we don't have outpatients that are coming in as well as people coming through the emergency department. Uh, but it can get very hectic sometimes. You know, at night, that's when you see a lot of the uh, traumas and um, real emergency cases coming through. It can be very high stress sometimes. Uh, General is a level one trauma center, so you can see some pretty terrible things come through the door, but um, you know, when people make it in and they recover and you get to help be a part of that, it just, it feels really nice. Remember, anytime during the live webcast, you may email your questions to healthinfocenter at camc.org or you can tweet your questions to CAMC underscore HS and use the hashtag ImagineU. Please include your school's name in the subject line or tweet. And don't forget to complete the online survey following the webcast. It's at this same website, camcinstitute.org forward slash ImagineU. We'll show you the surgery in just a few moments, but right now I'm pleased to introduce you to Dr. Shadi Abu Halima. He specializes in vascular surgery, he completed a general surgery fellow, uh, residency here at CAMC and then a vascular, vascular surgery fellowship at the University of North Carolina. He's certified by the American Board of Surgery and works in our vascular center of excellence. So welcome and thank you for taking your time this morning. Thanks, Dale. Appreciate you uh, to use me and um, love to help and um, show our students what we can do and what, uh, what their future will be if they, they start to uh, pursue a career in uh, medicine and hospitals for hospital care. So tell me, what made you interested in becoming a physician? I start with the family. I have, um, I have, uh, I have my father's a physician and um, my brother's a physician. I always enjoyed actually engineering and um, uh, mathematics and physics. Um, by um, the probably the end of my senior year, uh, high school, I started to get really interested in biology and even 
I'm interested in engineering, but the biology also starts to interest me. So I started thinking about doing a combined career of medicine that later on um, I applied my engineering and geometry in that. Well, good. Okay, so now explain to me the procedure that we're going to see today, an uh, aortic aneurysm. So aortic aneurysms, typically they are um, a bulge in the main artery of the, of, the, of the human being, which is called the aorta. So the aorta is, uh, I can see, show you the model here. This is the model of the aorta here, and uh, typically the artery is around uh, two centimeter in diameter. When it starts to bulge out more than three centimeters, we start to concern about this bulging. It's like a balloon. It can bust and, of course, can kill patients. So when they reach a, a critical size of five, five and a half centimeters, we start to tell the patient to offer the patient interventions because the risk of surgery or the risk of rupture of this aneurysm is pretty uh, much can kill them and they don't survive this. So um, we offer these patients this aneurysm repair traditionally with open surgery that has been established for more than 50 years in the country. But in the last 15 years, we have been um, using a minimally invasive procedure that goes through a small cut in the groins. So instead of doing a traditional open repair, which involve open the belly, which works well, but it's a really, it's an old fashioned and um, it causes a lot of pain. We offer them this sting graft. You can see there that it goes through a small, tiny incision, probably like a centimeter hole in each coin. Okay. Why don't you show the students the, the bulges that, that you're talking about? So I can show in this model here. This is, a, again, a, a picture of uh, the aorta here, <clears throat> which is probably around two centimeter in diameter. This is what we call the kidney artery. So you have the kidneys here, then the artery become bulging out here. <clears throat> in this particular case with the, with the patient I'm going to show you, this artery typically is branched into two arteries called the iliac arteries. And one of them, it looks normal here. The other one has also another bulge. So this patient does have an aneurysm involving his aorta. And the main one was actually involving his uh, iliac artery. So he had kind of more complex repair. Again, traditionally, we offer the patient in, uh, a surgery, but we decide to use sting graft, and I can show you a model of the sting graft here. So this stent goes through a catheter. This is the, that was when it opens up inside the patient, but usually it goes through a catheter that's small as this. So it's, if you compare it to my index finger, it's really smaller than index finger. So these go through a small, tiny holes, and... And so that's, that hole is, is in the leg. You make a hole exactly in the groins, we go into something called the femoral arteries, and we make a small cut through the femoral arteries with ultrasound and under X-ray, and we pass the stents under X-ray, and we deploy it so it works as by diverting the flow inside the stents instead of going to the aneurysm and prevent this from rupture in the future. Okay. It doesn't happen very often, but we're able to show you some of the background on this particular procedure because a Charleston TV station aired the patient's story in a couple different segments. Wes Armstead works at WCHS-TV, and he gave us permission to share his story before, during, and after his procedure. Uh, I take care of all the, uh, uh, the assignment desk work that I have at Channel 8, but I have a special project that I'm working on called Yellow Jacket Nation that I've been working on, where I am the, the photographer, the editor, so that takes up quite a bit of my time. I'm also a deacon at my church. I'm also in the men's chorus. I also like to go to Bible study on Saturdays. I have a full plate. It's pretty go, 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 go. But that on-the-go lifestyle for 63-year-old Wes Armstead came to a screeching halt just last month. Went to bed that evening, and I got up with a real bad stomach ache. At least what I thought was a stomach ache. After wrestling with that stomach pain and a nudge from his wife, Wes went to the emergency room where doctors did a CAT scan, finding a small infection in his colon. After they discovered what that was, they also noticed that I had some type of aortic aneurysm. And they would not have found that had I not went in with this stomach ache. An aortic aneurysm is a bulge in a section of the aorta, which is the body's main artery. It carries blood from the heart to the rest of the body. An aneurysm overstretches and weakens the artery, which could lead it to burst. That seems to be the concern, is that like it could burst. And if it bursts, then, you know, then that's going to be, uh, yeah, not good, not good. I can tell you probably half people don't even make it to the phone to make the 911 call. 
so half people will die. Dr. Shadi Abu Alima is Wes's vascular surgeon at CAMC. He explained to us that Wes's case is a bit different than most. His aneurysm is located in a branch of the aorta, which becomes the iliac artery. This artery is around a centimeter in diameter, that's normal people. Uh, his was around four centimeters, or four and a half centimeters. When they reach around four and a half centimeters, that's almost four to five times the normal size. That's pretty big. His chance of rupturing is around 40 to 50 percent. Because of that risk, Wes will have surgery this month to repair his aneurysm. In the meantime, he's preparing for several life changes afterward. I'm enjoying my cigarettes now, uh, but after the surgery, you know, no more. And dealing with the fear of the unknown. Once they get in there, you know, and start to look around, and, and who knows what else could be lurking. Your body's a miracle, but it's also a mystery. On February 5th, Wes Armstead went into surgery to have his aortic aneurysm repaired. Typically, this means there's a bulge in the aorta, which is the body's main artery. But Wes's aneurysm was in a branch of the aorta called the iliac artery. In Wes's case, unfortunately, he had an aneurysm actually involving this artery that goes to the pelvis. This um, artery goes to the, again, to the leg, and this goes to the pelvis. So in his case, we actually put a stent that looks like this. But we add another stent that I don't have a picture of, but it went actually with this stent and has uh, two legs that one go to this artery that goes to the pelvis and the other one go to the leg. Dr. Shani Abu Alima explains he used a newer generation of stents called a branch graft just developed over the last several years. It fixes iliac aneurysms in particular, lessening complications. If he came like probably five, ten years ago, we'll end up plugging this artery and extending this uh, stent all the way down to the leg artery and it's associated with significant pain and uh, we call claudication and limping in the buttocks area especially when they walk. That older procedure also often led to inadequate blood flow to the intestines and male impotence but medical advances also allowed Wes's surgery to be less invasive. Instead of having open surgery, which would have required up to six weeks of recovery time, instead, surgeons used an endovascular stent graft. This procedure involves two small incisions in the groin so that a thin tube can reach the aorta. It has been proven that 30 days uh, morbidity or complications much, much less. And recovery time is only two weeks. We visited Wes four days after surgery. You know, I feel like I'm getting a little stronger every day. Stacy, it's Wes for WCHS. How you doing, buddy? Other than feeling weak and tired, Wes's biggest recovery struggle has been boredom. I want to go do stuff, but I can't, and I know it. My family reminds me of that 24-7. Do what they tell you, do what they tell you. And that includes doctor's orders to quit smoking. It's been horrible. <laughs> it's been horrible, but I'm going to get past it. While Wes is looking forward to getting back at it, the downtime did give him a chance to reflect and count his blessings. I really have been blessed. I go into uh, an emergency room <coughs> with a problem not related to the problem that they found. And for that to be pointed out and to find the, the correct surgeon who knew exactly what he was looking at and had the procedure that would agree with me in his back pocket, you know, was truly, truly a blessing. I mean, I can't, oh God, he knows what he's doing. Don't make me cry. I'd like to thank Wes for allowing us to share that story. Remember, we want to hear from you, so anytime you have a question, just send us an email, healthinfocenter at camc.org, or go ahead and tweet your questions to us, camc underscore hs, and use the hashtag imagine you. Now, before we start the video, let me remind those of you with weak stomachs, this is an actual procedure. The video that you're about to see is graphic, and it shows close-up details of the surgery. So as we begin that, let me first... Um, ask you, doctor, to explain the staff that we're going to see in the, in the room, in the procedure room. So this procedure, of course, is a, we require everybody to help. We have a physician that will perform the procedure, usually an assistant or a teaching hospital, so we have a fellow or a resident that actually helps us with these procedures. We have an um, anesthesiologist and a CRNA or a certified RNA that actually put the patient's sleep and maintain that patient's sleep. We have um, a nurse that actually manages the patient during the procedure. 
and those two, typically two uh, radiology technologists or uh, radiation technology or RTs that actually help passing the procedure, perform the procedure with us too. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a look at the video and we'll, we'll talk about what we see and, and explain to the students and we'll answer their questions as we go. Perfect. And so you were, uh, were in, the, in an operating room. So this is a typical, we call a hybrid operating room. So it's a sterile operating room, but it has an x-ray machine. Uh, in our hospital, we have a call a ceiling fixed x-ray machine, which is, gives an excellent quality. Um, I'm performing the procedure, I'm on the patient on the right side. I have one of my fellows on the left side and I have two RTs on both our sides helping us. These procedures require to use x-ray. So we actually wear a lid apron and typically actually also head and um, eye protection with some lead glasses. Um, the procedure starts, as you see, with um, accessing both femoral arteries, as I explained before, with ultrasound needles, just really small, tiny needles. And then we pass this catheters into the groins and into the arteries. So you've got your hand right there at the hole in the groin that yep. you've made. We make this uh, probably a centimeter hole in the artery in, the, in both skin incisions. And we access the arteries through this with, a, with just small needles. And we pass, in the same time, we pass these sutures that actually will close the artery later on, will close the hole later on. That would make it actually minimally invasive and uh, make the patient go home next day. It's really, it's, uh, it's, that's a great technology that we have now. So how long is this <clears throat> procedure going to take? Um, typical procedures for aneurysms takes probably around an hour. Uh, if it is straightforward, uncomplicated cases. There's complex repairs that require sometimes two or three hours, but most of these cases that we do, I would say more than 90% of them at CMC, it, it's done under, um, under an hour of, of, uh, of procedure. And, and then the, <coughs> the recovery time, you, you said the patient went home the next day? That's actually the beauty about this. Uh, the old-fashioned procedure, which again works well, but patients typically stay in the hospital a week pain and have a lot of incision pain, uh, trouble with breathing sometimes. But these, pa these procedures, we do them um, in the last probably few years, we do them under uh, sedation. So we don't have to put the patient completely asleep. <coughs> and uh, patient um, go home next day. I mean, I have a 90 year old, I uh, walk in the hospital at seven o'clock next day and he was standing beside the bed, asked me to discharge him home. <laughs> we have a question from Mingo Central High School. What, what types of complications would a patient see with this procedure? So immediate kind of complication, it depends on the anatomy of the patient. So not everybody would be a good candidate or they have difficulty with getting these grafts. As I said, these are small catheters, although they are small, some people have a very small, tiny arteries in their groins. So it would be difficult to advance the catheters. It may require us to balloon the arteries. Sometimes they can uh, cause some bleeding. Uh, sometimes we'll end up with some damage to the kidneys, but uh, this is part of the compl immediate complication, but it rarely happens, but it, it could happen. Uh, long term, we're trying to avoid of core rupture. We want the patient to live longer and happy and not concerned about this aneurysm anymore. So there's something to watch for because sometimes we have to do some more procedures for these patients. And typically we follow these patients uh, every year with CAT scans and x-rays and ultrasounds. Uh, to see if they require any more interventions. You can see in the view there that, again, we put kind of bigger catheters, which is probably around eight millimeters in both, uh, both um, uh, groins. And um, um, in the West, this is a West picture of a case. Um, this this uh, device actually has two different uh, uh, devices, one of them um, has a device to repair the iliac aneurysm, which we're going to start with, then we fix the aortic aneurysm. So we had two different devices, and in this case, of course, we had to deploy one each time. So that took probably around two hours procedure. Okay, and, and you guys are, are looking at monitors, screens, what, what are you watching? So um, again, this, this is done really as, this, as I tell my patients, the big procedure is done from inside. So um, although some people say, well, you didn't do anything, it's actually passing wires and catheters. And we create this railroad track, and you can see we're passing all these catheters and balloons on top of these railroads. We have to do this under X-ray, we use um, radiation, and we use dye to see where we're going to. And um, 
this is the machine that's actually sitting between me and my uh, uh, scar, my fellow, is um, is actually producing X-ray, and we we review all the images as you see on the on the X-ray machine on the screens, and we mark what we need to do, and we pass the scatters, of course. <coughs> are, are these types of the, the aneurysms, are they hereditary? Um, there is some hereditary, of course, component. Uh, most of the patient um, does not have any um, association with like families, but if you have a family member that have actually an aortic aneurysm, we recommend to be screened for the other family members, especially male, mm -hmm. male members, because they, it is very, it's, it, it's high, it has a high probability to have an aneurysm too. Okay, a student from Mingo Central High School asked, her, her mom had a brain aneurysm and, and wanted to know if there would be concerns for that in the family or aortic or? So brain aneurysms, they act a little bit differently and it's kind of different pathology, but um, um, they, the, the disease process, of course, it sounds the same. Um, at the end of the day, it's a big bulge in the artery, uh, but involving the arteries in the brain. Um, it's very, it's not typically associated with aortic aneurysms that we actually treat as vascular surgeons. Uh, brain aneurysms are treated more often now with also endovascular techniques, which is minimally invasive with corning and, but it can require open craniotomies and clipping. But um, if, uh, if, uh, if patient has a brain aneurysm, it's uh, typically not associated with other part of the, of the abdomen aneurysms. Okay, so, we're watching you and, and your assistants as, as you run these wires up through the so, vessels. <laughs> so. Yeah, I know it's a, sometimes become like a, I tell, I tell my, my, uh, my fellows, it's like a spaghetti of wires. So you have to be, it's very, very um, 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 challenging sometimes. You require a lot of, you have to know exactly what you're doing, what pass wires. Um, I have my assistant on my right hand side is just holding the catheters, make sure that it doesn't move. Um, uh, the fellow will actually move the x-ray now to go to the exact position that I need to see so I can pass the balloons and catheters. Um, it's a very delicate procedure that is, again, if it's done right, patient do well and go home early. And most of them do well. How, how risky is this? I mean, what, what's the chance that, that you could rupture something in there? That's part of what we call the consent for the procedure. Any procedure in the world has, of course, risks of, uh, of complications. Uh, the chance of this is low. I mean, I uh, probably saw a couple, of, a couple of times in my life. And uh, it can be uh, dangerous because some patient can bleed really bad. Uh, so, but that's why we monitor them. We have the CRNA. We can see them behind the screen watching and uh, keep eye on the blood pressure, uh, keep eye on the heart rate. And whenever there is a notice of... Um, any changes in blood pressure, she will immediately notify us. Of course, on and off, we'll inject dye, and they will tell us if there's any leak or rupture. But because this is not an open procedure, you, you don't typically see a rush of blood that we see in open surgeries. So you can't tell if it's active bleeding immediately, but we have to keep monitoring. That's, that's the whole idea of active monitoring during these procedures. Okay, so what would you do if, if, if the aneurysm burst during the procedure? So we will proceed, so the two options are, if, I'm, if I have the catheters and wires in place and I have all the stents available, I will proceed immediately with advancing the catheters and deploying the stents in the position that I want to. And this will actually isolate the aneurysm and will control the rupture. In some situations, I have to require probably to open the abdomen um, immediately. That's what we do it in the upper room and this we call a hybrid room. So we can open the abdomen sometimes to control the bleeding and clamp it and convert the procedure to an open procedure. Okay, a question from Hurricane High School. Um, are aneurysms, are they common in younger people or is age a factor? Um, it's actually more common in older patients. So um, the, most of the patient we see is probably around 60 years old, 60 years old and above. Uh, I'm talking about uh, aortic aneurysms. Um, if there's a family history, they can actually come earlier, probably at, as, as, as young as I saw 45 and 50 year old, they have aneurysm. So it's something that we'll have to watch for. We screen a lot of people and it's part of the, actually the recommendation for uh, patients. 
unfortunately males that smoke, that's very high risk to have this, and we typically require them to be screened for aneurysms when they are 65 years old. That's the age recommendation by the CMS. So uh, we have a question from the, the Mon Tech Center up in Morgantown. Um, what are the symptoms that this patient didn't know what was going on when he came in? Um, when I say screening, um, in medicine we call screening, that means looking for a disease that has no symptoms. So people screen for breast cancer or colon cancer by physical exam or by colonoscopy. The screening for aneurysms happened because more than 90% of patients have this aneurysm silent. They have no symptoms at all. It's very unusual for the aneurysm to cause symptoms, unfortunately, till they rupture or bust. So if they bust, that becomes really dangerous and they can die from that. I want to say they can die because we can, we can, if we can get them early, we can fix them. Uh, but um, typically we recommend the patient to be screened, to be have a physical exam annual because these patients, we can catch these aneurysms and we can uh, hopefully fix them earlier before they bust. Again, 90% of these are asymptomatic. That means they have no symptoms, they're silent. Um, so we recommend people with family history to be screened, to go talk to their family doctors, maybe get to just a simple ultrasound of the belly that will kill, tell them if there's um, um, aneurysm or not. What's the most common type of aneurysm? Um, in the arterial system, the aneurysm's most common part is actually affecting um, called the ascending part of the aorta, which is the first part of the aorta that goes, that comes out to the heart. The aorta, um, okay. But the other part, which is very common, which is we, we involve with the care as vascular surgeons, is the, the, the infrarenal or the aorta that involved the, the main artery below the kidney arteries. That's a very common and that's the most common aneurysms. But aneurysms can happen any part of the body. They can involve what called the iliac arteries, as in West case here. It can involve arteries in the legs, behind the knees, and the groins. Um, it can involve arteries to the kidneys, uh, arteries to the intestines. These are very unusual aneurysms, but it can be there. But the most common is aortic aneurysm. And as I said, it doesn't cause symptoms, but if they kill, they can cause pain or compression, which is very unusual. And you mentioned the staff in the, in the uh, operating room are wearing lead uh, vest, protect them from the, <coughs> um, the x-rays and, and special eyewear for the same reason. What about the patient? So the patient itself, <clears throat> unfortunately, will be exposed during the procedure for radiation. Of course, we monitor the amount of radiation the patient will get exposed to. Uh, there is a safety limit that we, a lot of time we stop and we just, we stop offering the patient more procedure because it's, there'll be too much toxic radiation to them. Um, again, is it dangerous to cause cancer? Of course, if he got too much radiation, that's overdose his lifespan limit, of course. But uh, these procedures, even with this X-ray machine, they're pretty safe. They, we use lower dose of amount of radiation. Um, we don't, we have this we call image intensifier, so we can focus on one part of the body that actually decreases radiation to the patient. So what are we seeing here? So this image, again, we inject dye, which is typically you can see is, is more of a blackish color in the X-ray machine. And we can see in the view this metal stuff, all this um, the lines is actually where the, the stent itself is sitting. And this is after we deploy the stents, the kidney artery is going to the sides, and then the, the, the blood is going inside the stents instead of going to the aneurysm itself. So we finally isolate the aneurysm. On the left side of the screen, I don't know if we would just repeat that, but you can see the blood going to this artery that splits into call the right and the, the internal iliac and the external iliac artery. And this way we isolate the aneurysm in the groin too. too. Okay, so another question from Mingo Central High School. Why do you go through the groin to get to the aneurysm? Uh, it's just uh, easy access. It's, this artery is very, it's a big artery, uh, easy to repair either with surgically or with percutaneous technique. That means with just putting stitches through the skin. Um, um, it has the least amount of complication if I go from other parts of the artery, like uh, from the chest arteries or the neck arteries, because these can, can be risky causing strokes or other complications. Um, most of the technology developed to use this artery because it's almost our, uh, our uh, gate to the body to do most of the endovascular procedures. Okay, so uh, how soon after a procedure does the patient get up and move around, walk around? 
Um, I can tell you most of them will, because we do this and sometimes under general anesthesia or sedation, they will be down at least for six hours, which is probably safe. After six hours, they can walk. Uh, most of them will be sleepy during the day, so you go home. There was actually trials now in, um, not in the United States, and actually Europe, of actually discharging the patient the same day. So they'll probably be going home probably in the future with lower catheters. Even I'm talking about eight millimeter catheter, I think the future will have a four millimeter catheter that that actually get the patient home same day after this procedure. So they'd be mobilized walking home. So given the size of the, the hole that you poked into the groin, are, do you have stitches or band-aids? How do you Yeah, so up? there's two components. The, 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 the artery itself, there's a hole in the artery which is under the skin by probably an inch. Uh, we put stitches under the skin. We don't see them now. This one on the video is a skin sketch itself, and it's usually one stitch that we actually close the artery. So this less than a centimeter hole, it can be stitched with one artery. Sometimes if it's too small, we'll just put a Band-Aid in it and we'll heal up within a couple of days. So, um, I mean, pain-wise, it's a very tolerable procedure, very, very unusual to have any, any severe pain with this procedure. You'll have mild pain that actually responds very well to just over-the-counter stuff like Tylenol. Okay. So, how many of these procedures have you done? Um, in my practice, probably close to, I mean, three, four hundred procedures. Okay. Um, um, in our hospital, we are uh, part of the biggest institution that in, this, in the state that we perform for this. We perform probably around 100 to 150 procedures a year uh, for these aneurysms. Um, so, it's a, it's a common procedure that we perform and uh, we're, uh, we're expert here at CMC with that. So, what's uh, one of the questions from Mingo Central High Schools? What's your daily routine? How many of these procedures do you do? How many patients do you see? So, this is not the main procedure we do as vascular surgeons. Main procedures involve we we take care of different stuff, including uh, uh, patients that require dialysis access. They go to because they have kidney failure. We create shunts in their arms, put catheters in their necks. Uh, people that have um, uh, trouble with the blood flow to their legs, we put stents in them or we do bypasses in them. Um, we do um, clean up some wounds. Um, some patients require procedures for um, their neck arteries, they got blocked and they develop strokes, so we end up cleaning these arteries or putting a stents to them. It's a very wide variety of procedures, and of course, we don't this, uh, this procedure. This is a, probably in our hospital, as I said, probably 100, 150, so there's these are done probably uh, around two or three a week that we do um, as a group. Uh, again, it's a, that's a common procedure that we do here. Um, but routinely we do perform more than a couple to 3,000 procedures in general involving the variety of this, I mean, these diseases involving the vascular system. Okay, so uh, what can people do to prevent aneurysm? Um, I think if we have a good answer, I will, will be very rich. <laughs> Uh, and I hope, I hope somebody is, is, is listening to this will find the magic bullet in the future and will tell us. Uh, research is being done and we're trying to find really the medicine to treat aneurysms. Uh, there's nothing that in the literature now that's available. The best thing we tell patients to be screened, get fixed early if they're big aneurysms. If they have a small aneurysm, they just need to stop smoking. Uh, they need to stop smoking anyway, but they need to stop smoking if they are, uh, have aneurysms. They need to take medicine like um, cholesterol medicine that actually help the degeneration or the aneurysm getting bigger and watch the blood pressure. So it's a lot of lifestyle things that you do to, to prevent or minimize. De definitely risk. lifestyle. There's unfortunately, there was again no magic bullet that I can do to prevent, to repair this with the medicine, but there is a way to try to prevent it from getting bigger and bigger and probably require a procedure. that. Of course, any procedure can potentially has complications. So if I can treat this with medicine, prevent this from getting bigger, I think it would be great. So of course, lifestyle modification, as I said, smoking cessation, blood pressure monitoring control, and taking medicine for cholesterol will work great. Okay. So how long have you been doing vascular surgery? Uh, personally, I've been in practice for eight years now. Um, of course, the medicine, start with you, I mean, from the time you finish high school, so um, it took a long time to get to be, become a vascular surgeon, but I think it's worth it. Um, uh, for me, it probably took like 16 years, but 
at the end of the day, you're a vascular surgeon, and you take care of a lot of patients, and you enjoy it. Well, in, in education, you have college, you have residency, well, you have medical school, then you have residency, <coughs> then you have fellowship, and then you And then you have the, so yeah. it's, it's probably average around 15 years to become a vascular surgeon after high school. People think it's like, oh, it's longer than even school itself, but um, I don't think it need to be shorter. I mean, some people can finish it in 12 years, um, which works great. Um, either way, I think you have to have a well-trained physician uh, to take care of this problem. But again, physician cannot do this by himself without the help of the other team, of course. It's a teamwork. Okay, I have a question from Spring Valley High School. Um, now that you've fixed this aneurysm, what are the chances of it happening again? Um, the chance of degeneration, we call, or the aneurysm become bigger, it, in the same location is probably less than 5%. And that's why this particular repair needs to be monitored for future. We cannot just say, this is done, uh, don't come back. These patients need to be managed. It's a lifestyle changing thing. They have to come back every year for follow-up checks, getting x-rays, uh, CAT scans, or ultrasounds. Um, for other locations of the body, we also monitor them. Um, like this aneurysm in the, we call the infrarenal or the below the kidney arteries. It ha if it happens to a patient, there's around 20% chance it could happen to their chest arteries too, okay. and their lifespan. Um, what's the chance of failure for, for this aneurysm in this same spot? Um, as I said, for if you follow what the device instructions for use uh, is, these devices last for a really long time, and we have patients that live with no trouble. Of course, we have to follow the rules. I mean, sometimes we modify things just because some people are not fit for procedures or for open surgeries, but most of patients do really well, but they need to be monitored, of course. Is there anything that a patient cannot do after having this procedure done? Um, Physically? A, or? Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. As a, I think it's just, um, even before the procedure, I tell my patient, this has been going for years. Uh, I don't want to be scared about it. I mean, you have to be concerned, but it changed your lifestyle, but it will be repaired hopefully when we get scheduled because there's not an emergency. Most of them are asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. After the procedure, they go back to normal, normal lifestyle. Doing the procedure as we did with, in the videos, it's just a small puncture wound in the wounds unless they develop more complications like blockage in the leg arteries or blockage in the kidneys. Most patients go and live their life as, as much as they want. They do all the activities they want. Okay. So, um, we, again, we're just a small hole in the groin, but what are the chances of infection during this procedure? This is a this is very uncommon procedure to develop infection. It's probably happened less than 1% one, 1 of the time. Can you, is the aneurysm, will it lead to any other health problems, or is it a symptom of anything else going on? It was a great question, Dale. Um, it, it could be associated with other diseases in the, in the, in the body. So aneurysms, as I said, it could be associated with other aneurysms. Unfortunately, probably 40% of these patients, they have, they have been history of smoking, so they have been exposed to cigarettes, or they have high blood pressure, they have diabetes. So they will have other associated risk factors of having heart attacks, blockage in the heart, um, disease affecting their carotid arteries and strokes. Um, which happens probably 20% of people with aneurysms. Um, they could develop blockage in the leg arteries. So um, this is a sign of, uh, un unfortunately, atherosclerotic or vascular disease in the body that need to be watched for. Okay. So do we know, we know that smoking, you know, it is, causes a lot of vascular problems. Mm -hmm. um, do we know enough about vaping yet? And the, the it's, it's not, I, ca I cannot just talk about it, it's really, there's a lot of talk about how, how safe it is. I personally don't think it's very safe. I, would, I prefer not tell my patient, forget about smoking at all, find a different good habit uh, if you have to, but um, vaping is still, you inhaling some toxins or some chemicals that we really don't know the long-term effect because this needs to follow up for 10 years or 20 years before we find out how cancerous they are or how how detrimental to health. Um, I think it's, of course, cigarette itself is, a, I consider it as evil, uh, but, um, and vaping probably better, uh, or less evil, but I, I don't think it's probably the answer. So, um, when, a, when a patient is scheduled for a procedure, 
they, you, you check them out and evaluate them. What if they're not physically fit? They need the procedure, but they're, they're not well enough. So great. So this is, this is what comes to we call in medicine the consent for surgery. So we have to sit down. This is not a simple procedure. I'm going to just remove a mole from the skin. These are big procedures. Even we do through a small, tiny incisions that did, does develop some potential complication. This procedure, chance of having uh, infection or uh, damage to the artery in the groin or as bleeding, we, we, I, I quote around 3% risk of having complications, uh, including death. But uh, so if the patient risk of rupture is more than the risk of complications, then we offer them the procedure because the benefit of the procedure is higher than the risk of the surgery. If a patient comes in and he has a really bad lungs or bad heart or he has active cancer, I don't think we should offer them the procedure unless they are like 10 centimeters, you know, because the risk of rupture at 10 centimeters is probably around 50%. <coughs> we have a, uh, time for just a couple more questions. Um, and we have one from, <coughs> from Polka High School. What's the, the most uh, complicated surgery that you've participated in? Uh, um, I was involved with the aneurysm repair that was actually involving a patient's chest and abdomen, including the kidney arteries and the intestinal arteries. Um, I remember starting the procedure around um, 7 o'clock in the morning and finishing around 9 o'clock at night. So, wow. so it has a lot of radiation. Um, I think I lost, of, lost, lost probably four pounds that day. <laughs> <laughs> What's the youngest patient you've ever performed a surgery on? Um, in my training, I did procedures for probably one year old. Okay. One day, sorry, one day old. During your uh, general surgery? During my general surgery training. But as a vascular surgeon, uh, well, um, it's very unusual to perform procedures for, um, for, uh, for young kids. It's not, the vascular disease is not common in the young kids. Uh, but uh, probably the youngest one was a trauma, uh, and he was like five years old. So uh, another question from Hurricane High School, while we've got you here. What advice do you have for people who are sitting there watching right now who want to be a physician? Um, if you like to be a physician, I would say take a deep breath. It's going to be a long trip, but it's worth it. I think um, if you like this career and you think you will succeed in it, I think you should pursue it because um, people think about money or the glory is about just patient care and the satisfaction when the patient smile on your face and you say thank you. So if you like being take care of patients, um, any healthcare, any any profession in healthcare, I think great. Um, I again I enjoy being a physician and I enjoy um, seeing my patient doing well and um, and appreciate what we do for them. So I know it's a long trip, as I tell all my, um, my friends and family, but I think it's worth it. All right, great. Well, let me again thank you for being here with us today, for taking your time, explaining the procedure, and, and showing us uh, all of this and answering all these questions. Oh, thank you, Dale, and thanks for having me, and um, good luck to everybody here, guys. Great. So keep following CAMC underscore HS on Twitter or just refresh your um, timeline using the Imagine You hashtag. We'll answer any remaining questions that we didn't have time to answer during the webcast. Also, don't forget to complete your online survey and give us feedback for today's presentation. Just go to camcinstitute.org forward slash Imagine You. We use your comments to make changes and improvements for future programs. Um, also, most people only think of hospitals uh, as having doctors and nurses working here, but there are a wide variety of jobs. And for those of you interested in a healthcare career, CAMC is pleased to offer many opportunities for you to explore healthcare. You can go to camc.org forward slash careers to learn about medical explorers, volunteering, job shadowing, and much, much more. Uh, and if you're really serious about a healthcare career, you can check out CAMC's Career Roadmap. You find education that's required, what colleges or career and technical centers offer various programs to get you into your healthcare career. Also, on this careers page, you'll find uh, research where you can check out each job and you can search for a job that's for you uh, just by going down through those center sections and searching.
for your jobs. Also, in the additional resources section there to the right, um, you can check out the information that we have to help uh, you pay for your education. Thank you again for watching this webcast. Imagine You is a collaborative effort of the West Virginia Department of Education, Health Sciences Education Division, and Charleston Area Medical Center. And as we leave you, you'll see some of the names of the people who have worked on today's webcast and a list of the schools that joined us. Thank you and have a great rest of the day.